May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Do you remember your baptism? <laughs> Although I suspect some of you were baptized as infants, I'm guessing there were others of you, like me, who were baptized as adults. In my case, I was a junior in high school when my whole family was baptized together. That was my mother and father and sister and I. It was quite the day at the Church of the Holy Cross in Dallas, I'll tell you. One of the things that I will never forget took place after we had been sprinkled with water and sealed with holy oil and given our baptismal candles. My mother, tightly holding on to her candle, leaned over to me and whispered, Do you feel it? <laughs> and I answered, What? <laughs> and she said, The Holy Spirit. I don't know. What does it feel like? <laughs> And then she said, well, it feels kind of warm, and it's starting at my feet. So I looked down, and wouldn't you know, there was hot wax from her candle <laughs> dripping all over the tops of her shoes. Well, melted wax aside, it was a beautiful and meaningful occasion. Our baptismal liturgy, a part of which we will be repeating in a few minutes when we renew our baptismal vows, says a lot about who we are and what we profess to believe. And yet when I compare it to the account told in today's gospel reading, it seems so different, so sanitized from what Jesus experienced that day in the River Jordan. Now, I think in part it's different because we have lost that sense of danger associated with the baptisms that John was performing and that Jesus received. Danger in part because John was a radical dissident who had fled the comforts of life in Jerusalem as the son of a temple priest, preferring instead to live in the desert and just wear camel's hair and eat locusts and wild honey. See, when John preached his message of repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was confronting both the religious and the political powers of his day. And that was some radical stuff. Instead of cooperation and accommodation and resignation, John challenged the political and religious establishment with a message of protest and renewal. So when Jesus was baptized by John, he was essentially making a statement that he too was signing on to this kind of risky fringe movement. Now there was also a sense of risk involved by virtue of water itself, because the ancient view of water was something to be feared and something that only God could deliver one from. From the beginning of creation, when God parted the waters and brought order out of chaos, to Noah and the great flood, to parting of the waters of the Red Sea, over and over, the ancient stories told that water was dangerous. Then there was the River Jordan itself. You know, typically in the Episcopal Church, we perform baptisms at a nice font. And we carefully dip a very small amount of water and we either pour or sprinkle it over someone's forehead. It's very nice and tidy. You're even given a little towel to catch any little drifts that might come down. Oh, and of course you're inside 
a nice, warm, comfortable building. Now, don't get me wrong, I like all those comforts. <laughs> but I also want to make clear that although our actions are demure, they in no way take away the effectiveness of the sacrament itself. God works equally well in the sacrament of baptism, whether you are sprinkled or you don't. I do want to make the point, though, that we have lost that sense of danger and risk involved in stepping off a dry riverbank into the mud and the dirty water of the Jordan. So why did Jesus do it? Have you ever wondered that? After all, according to John, baptism is for the purpose of repentance and forgiveness of sins. What did Jesus need to repent of? Why would Jesus intentionally do something so risky as to be baptized by a radical preacher named John? Well, I believe that Jesus submits to baptism, kneeling in the mud and the muck and the mire, for the same reason that he is born in a manger, and that he eats with prostitutes and tax collectors, and he cries and he prays, and he sleeps in a garden, and he dies a painful, very human death. Quite simply, Jesus comes to be like us, so that we can grow to be like him. Or said another way, Jesus is baptized into our humanity, so that we can be baptized into his divinity. Jesus stood with the other people in the waters of the Jordan to let them know that it was all right. And because he was with them, the people did not need to be afraid of water or political powers or a religious system that told them they weren't good enough. It's sort of like that scene that we probably all witnessed in the summertime at a swimming pool. There's some small child standing on the edge of the pool in tears, afraid to get in the water, and his parents or grandparents stand waist deep in the pool beckoning him or her, basically saying, it's okay, I'm here, I've got you, you're safe. That was what Jesus did at his baptism. He stood in that water and he told us, it's okay. That he is right here for us, so we don't have to be afraid. In other words, he made God's love tangible. Now, those words about making things tangible always remind me of one night during a thunderstorm when my young son Joseph was scared. And he ran into my room and jumped into my bed saying that he was scared to be alone. I tried to reassure him by saying, oh honey, you know that you are never alone. You don't have to be afraid, God is with you. Well, my son Joseph, ever the pragmatist, said, I know that, but right now I need someone with skin. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Jesus gives God skin. Now, I think we know in our heads that God loves us. I think we know in our heads that really we don't have to be afraid. But even so, we live in a dangerous world. And at times, we want to hold that hope in our hands, don't we? To remind ourselves that God's love and God's hope are real. That's what the sacraments are all about. When we receive the water of baptism, or the bread, and hopefully one day again soon the cup, of communion, those are the things that Jesus 
has given us so that we can feel and smell and taste and take hold of. To remind us of all the ways that God has loved and cared for God's people across the ages. And to remind us that God's love and care is with us even today. God, through Jesus, took the risky step to become one with us, even in all the muck that is a part of human existence. He stands with us so that we might all hear the only voice that can tell us who we really are and whose we really are. In this season after Christmas, my friends, listen. Listen for that voice. We are God's chosen. We are God's children. We are God's pleasure. Even in the deepest water, we are God's beloved. Amen. <laughs>